Good morning and welcome to the class Science Behind Energy Technology. This class will consist of six units. The first one will be on fire. Then we'll talk about coal, steel, and steam, oil, explosions in cars, electricity, and the distribution grid, nuclear power, and then finally population and clean energy sources. We'll start with the science of fire. We're going to use a very basic model of the atom. Um, it goes all the way back to the Greeks and Hindus. And one of their first concepts was they asked the philosophical question of, uh, can, in, can matter be infinitely divided? Or do you get to some basic building block that cannot be further divided? And the smallest building block of each element was called an atom, which is Greek for indivisible. And therefore, in their idea, there were dozens of different atoms, one for each element, a different atom for gold, sulfur, etc. Now, this, I, this was a very basic concept, but in the 1900s, uh, scientists found out that atoms actually were composed of even simpler building blocks. And we have this model from the early 1900s, which is a nice, simple model of the uh, atom. And it's really all we need to, uh, to understand a lot of chemistry and, and other uh, scientific uh, phenomena. And in that model, there are only three particles. One is a positive particle called a proton. The other is a negative particle called a neutron. Or excuse me, a, a negative particle called an electron. And a neutral one called a neutron. So in this model, everything is just made of three kinds of particles. And the structure of the atom uh, in this model was that the protons and neutrons were clustered together in the center in something called the nucleus. And here's a model of that. Notice that the center has the positive uh, uh, particles and uh, they're held together by something we call the strong nuclear force, which overcomes their natural repulsion of each other because of the same charge, and neutrons. And then there's a number of electrons that surround that nucleus, uh, and there tend to be uh, the same number of negative electrons as there are positive protons. And so this is the structure of the atom that was common in the early 1900s, uh, which we'll use for this class. Now, the electrons spin, and they, they, when they spin, they form little magnetic fields. And as such, they tend to pair up. And the, as the electrons uh, gather around the nucleus, they form layers. So for, recall, for every positive proton in the middle, there's an electron in the outer, outer layers. Uh, so as we go to larger and larger atoms with more and more protons in the nucleus, we have more and more electrons in the outer, uh, outer areas. And the first layer, uh, the one that's closest to the nucleus, only has two electrons. Then the second and third layers can hold up to eight more. Um, so these, uh, so this makes up the first three layers of uh, uh, the types of atoms, and it accounts for the the basic structure of um, uh, the, the the basic elements of which most things are made. Now, if you have an atom with a full outer layer. One of the characteristics of that kind of atom is that it doesn't react with other atoms much. Here's an example. Neon has 10, 10 protons in the nucleus. And in the next two outer layers, the first layer has two. And the next layer has eight for a total of 10. So neon is characterized by, uh, it's, it's called an inert gas. It doesn't react with other things. So the the way the uh, outer layers of electrons uh, are filled in determines their chemistry. So there's a whole uh, group of uh, atoms like this. And when the ones that have the, the full outer shells are called inert gases. Helium is the smallest. It's got two protons and two electrons. Then neon is the next. The next layer, the next uh, element with a full layer is argon and then so on to krypton, xenon, and radon. The thing they all have in common is they don't react with anything else, and they're all gases. Now, 
The number of electrons in the outermost layer, they're the most in influential on how the atom behaves with other atoms because a nearby atom would see the outer layer of electrons and what's in that outer layer would determine how it would react with other atoms. And so we can take the atoms and arrange them in order of increasing number of protons in the nucleus and associated electrons in the outer layer. And because their chemical behavior, their behavior with each other, with other atoms is determined by that outer layer, uh, then the uh, nature of the chemical behavior repeats. And something that repeats is called periodic. So we, we arrange these things in what's called a periodic table. And uh, I'm going to show you just the first three rows of the periodic table here. Now the first row only has two things in it. On the far left you have hydrogen and it has one proton and one electron. So it has one electron in the outermost layer. Then the next element has two protons and two electrons. The first layer is full when it has two. So it's way over on the right in the column of inert gases. Then we go to the element with three protons, which is lithium. And in that element, the next electron will go in the outer layer by itself. And so it will behave in a similar manner to hydrogen in that it has one electron in its outermost layer. Beryllium has two in the outermost layer. And then we go jump across to boron, uh, which has three, carbon four, uh, neon five, oxygen six, fluorine seven, and then neon 10. So uh, then if you start the next row with sodium in A, it, it starts a new layer of electrons and it has one in the outermost layer, then two in magnesium. So notice magnesium is right below beryllium. They both have two in the outer layer and it's a partial layer, so they behave similarly. So in a periodic table, if you know the behavior of one of the chemicals or one of the elements, if you look in the same column, you'll have a clue as to how the other elements in that column behave. All of the elements on the far right are inert gases. They're all, they, they don't interact much at all. All of the elements in the far left have one electron in the outer layer. They're very reactive. They react with lots of things. So this allows you to predict behaviors. Molecules are groups of two or more atoms. So for example, uh, when, uh, when atoms get together, they can share their outer electrons and tend to form complete layers. And when they do that, it's called a covalent bond. Here's an example. Let's say we have two hydrogen atoms. Each, each has one electron in the outer layer. To achieve a full layer of two, two hydrogens could pair up and share their electrons. And that's what they do. This is, what, this is a way you can predict how atoms will combine to form molecules. And so this is, this is what we call a molecule of hydrogen. Now, Here's another example. Oxygen has six electrons in its outer layer. It's too short of a full outer layer. So if we combine it with hydrogen, each hydrogen has one extra electron. So we could predict that oxygen would combine with two hydrogens. And that is indeed what happens. And this is a very common molecule. It's water. So we say it's H2O, which means it's got two hydrogens and one oxygen. So we can predict things. Let's take another let's take another look at this periodic table. Let's take carbon. Carbon is going to be very important to us in this chap in this class. And so it's important you understand some elemental things about the science of carbon. Carbon has four electrons in its outer shell, which makes it one of the most versatile atoms that we know of because it can combine with up to you, know, you can combine in several different ways. And so one of the simplest ways it combines is if you mix carbon with hydrogen. Hydrogen, you know, the carbon has four uh, places in its outer shell to fill, and it could do that by combining with four hydrogens. So that forms a, a, a molecule with one carbon and four hydrogens. Up here is how we write it. Notice the C 
and then H4, the lower, the lower level four tells you how many hydrogen atoms there are for each carbon. This particular molecule has its own name. We call it methane. It's the primary ingredient in natural gas. And we'll come back to methane uh, fairly often in the next couple of, chat, couple of uh, classes. So this is how you, you can predict by looking at the periodic table how atoms will combine to form molecules. This is one of the biggest fundamental concepts of chemistry. If you get this, you're really, you've really learned something. So let's look at some other common molecules, see if you can predict them. We know that one, one oxygen combines with two hydrogens, that's water. And here's another way of drawing it, uh, just drawing a model showing an oxygen and hydrogens. Now, uh, one carbon could combine with two oxygens. Recall that uh, the carbon needs four, four atoms to, to fill its outer shell. Oxygen uh, needs two. So they can get together and share electrons to form full outer shells of 10. And one way to do that is at a ratio of one carbon to two oxygens. This is what we call carbon dioxide, where di means two. So you've heard a lot about carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, etc. We'll come back to that. We'll use it many times. So this is one, one important uh, molecule to understand. So let's talk about the atmosphere now. We're going to shift sciences. We just did chemistry. Now we're going to do some uh, uh, earth science. Uh, let's, let's talk about the concept of dry air. Um, air can have water dissolved in it. So when we talk about dry air, we're going to kind of set that aside. Let's say not, let's not count the amount of water. Let's just look at what the air, what the atmosphere of the earth would be like with no water dissolved in it. If that was the way we looked at it, uh, more than three quarters, 98% of the air that we're breathing right now is nitrogen, and it's in the form of a molecule of N2. So nitrogen is sharing uh, three outer electrons uh, to form a molecule of N2. And this is important because every time you have a fire or a combustion engine or anything like that, every time it draws air in from the atmosphere, most of the air it draws in is nitrogen. Oxygen is 21% in, mo in a molecule of O2. Notice 78 and 21% were up to, already up to 99%. So that accounts for 99% of all the air we're breathing right now. Argon uh, is the third most common uh, molecule in the atmosphere, and it's almost 1%. So now we're, not, now we're not up to 99 and almost 100%. The rest of the molecules of, uh, that are in the atmosphere make up less than 1% uh, of that atmosphere. The one you've heard a lot about is carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide makes up a little under four hundredths of 1% of the atmosphere. And so, it's interesting because we'll find out later that this carbon dioxide is where plants get the uh, carbon to make uh, to, to build themselves out of. So even though there isn't a lot of carbon dioxide in the air, it's a pretty important gas when it comes to life on Earth. Now, let's go back to this dry air concept. The reason we took the dry the water out because it can vary so much. Uh, air can hold water, it can dissolve water into it. You don't see it but the humidity in the air is, is a measure of how much water is in it. And that can vary from zero, almost zero over the driest parts of the deserts, uh, up to 4%, roughly. So that's, that's how much the water content can vary. Now we'll jump over to physics. The energy of motion. We're going to define two very important basic concepts. The first is heat. And heat is the rapid motion and vi or vibration of atoms and molecules. So if we could see the individual molecules or atoms, they're too tiny for us to see directly, they would be moving around at like 700 miles an hour in the, in the air we're looking through right now. And they're bouncing off of each other. They're bouncing off the walls. And if I increase the heat, that means they go faster. So that's what I mean by heat. Now temperature is related to that. 
temperature is the average uh, speed or energy of the atoms and molecules. So we can put uh, we can put something in there that can respond to that heat, and then put numbers on it and call it a temperature scale. So it's a subtle difference. Heat is the energy of the uh, energy of motion of the atoms. Temperature is a measure of the average of what's in there. Okay. So think on that a little bit. You can ask me questions later. Now, the other thing to recognize is that that's an average, that there's a lot of variability. Some of these atoms go much faster than others. Some go much slower. So the, the average gives you kind of the middle uh, measure of it, but it's important to recognize that some of those atoms will be almost stopped and some will be going much faster. But again, in a, in, the, in a room right now at this temperature, the air molecules in this uh, room are going about 700 miles an hour, which, by the way, is the speed of sound, and that's why. But well, that's another that's another. Time. Okay, a little more physics. Why does hot air rise? Well, the first concept is is kind of a, it's hard to grasp because we're talking about something that's invisible, but air has weight. If we took a square inch on on top of our heads and took that square inch straight up 50 miles all the way to the top of the atmosphere, that column of air would weigh about 15 pounds, almost 15 pounds. And that's what we call one, one atmosphere of pressure, that kind of weight. So that's this invisible uh, weight of air surrounding us. So the higher up in the atmosphere you go, the less of it there is, and therefore the, the pressure drops until you get all the way out into space where you don't have any. Now, if we heat up the air, remember heat is the motion of molecules. If, they, if we heat up the air, those molecules go faster, and they tend to push and push other molecules out of the way. And so there are fewer of them in a given space. And the result is, that that space of, uh, of air weighs less. So the weight of the hot gas is less than the surrounding cooler gas. So the weight of the cooler gas will displace the warm air and push it upward. Cool gas goes down, the hot air goes up. So to make a hot air balloon, we, we capture hot gases in the balloon and it's the cool air surrounding the balloon that displaces it upwards. And so that's why hot air rises. It's because it's not as heavy as the cool gas surrounding it, and the cool gas pushes it up out of the way. Okay, another physics concept, light. We know that light consists of small bundles of energy that have properties like wavelength. And there's lots of different wavelengths of light. The human eye can perceive a fairly narrow range of those wavelengths. So that's what makes something visible light. It's just that the human uh, eye can perceive it. So if we take a look at these different wavelengths, um, we've assigned different names to these different wavelengths of light. And the, the longest ones are red, and the different colors go from red all the way to the shortest wavelengths, which are blue. Now, white light is a mix of all those colors, but they, they can be separated, especially if they get bent by glass or by little droplets of water suspended in the air after a thunderstorm. So when we see a rainbow, it's because the white light has been spread out and we can see those colors. Now, what we can't see is that there are invisible colors that our eyes don't perceive. The wavelengths that are too long for us to see are called infrared. The ones that are too short for us to see are called ultraviolet. But they're still there and they're very important in understanding heat and energy and uh, especially the infrared. Okay, back to chemistry. We're going to cover a lot of stuff today. Um, one, of the, one of the concepts here is chemical energy. 
when we when we make molecules, there can be a, a energy stored in that bond, kind of like springs. And so if if a if a if a molecule is formed, it'll have a certain amount of ener potential energy stored in it. And in some molecules, if you rearrange them or break them apart, that energy is released, and it it ends up is high speed, the molecules come apart at high speed and at high heat. So remember this heat is the speed of the molecules. Now there's a unit of energy that we'll use called the electron volt. Remember electron is one of the three basic particles of the atom. And uh, I'm just going to define this energy of electron volt. It's it's how much energy an electron would have if you, if you uh, hooked it up to a one volt battery. So that's that's a basic unit of energy. We're going to use it for comparison purposes, so it isn't real important you understand exactly what it means. Now, the chemical bonds, like uh, when we make carbon dioxide and things like that, they have about four to five electron volts per molecule. Okay. So that's the kind of energy levels that, that uh, uh, you get when you have chemical reactions in the single digit electron volt range. Now we're going to jump again. Now we're going to jump to the sun. And this, now we're going to jump ahead to, the, to the, uh, the era of Einstein. And he discovered that mass is a very concentrated form of energy. This is a revolutionary concept. And we know that uh, if you take two hydrogen nuclei and force them together, the sun can do it because of its tremendous gravity. It can force those two protons together into a new nucleus with two protons. The, the element with two protons is helium. It turns out that the helium atom has a little less mass than the sum of the two hydrogen atoms. This mass gets converted into energy. Perhaps you've seen this formula, E equals mc squared, without really knowing what it stood for. Well, E is the energy. M is the missing mass. It's the difference in mass before and after a reaction like fusing two hydrogen nuclei together. C stands for the speed of light, which is a huge number. It's a really, you know, speed of light's really fast. It's 186 million uh, what, miles per second. It's three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It's a big number, and you square that. So what this means is that a little bit of mass conversion results in a release of a whole lot of energy. So for example, on the sun, if the sun's gravity causes two hydrogens to fuse together, the mass conversion there releases 14 million electron volts per molecule. Recall that chemistry is, you know, chemical reactions are about are single digits, two to four electron volts. Nuclear fusion of atoms is in the millions of electron volts. So that's important to recall. We'll talk about that later. Okay, now we're going to go to biology and talk about photosynthesis. You know enough chemistry now to understand this part. Plants use the energy they get from the sun to cause the, the molecules of water and carbon dioxide to break apart and rearrange and in, into molecules of carbon and hydrogen and then emit oxygen molecules back out in the air. This process is called photosynthesis. And the solar energy that it got from that solar fusion of hydrogen that came to the earth is stored in these new molecules of hydrogen and carbon that we call hydrocarbons. Here's a diagram. We got the sun from the energy, which is from that nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium. It comes to the earth. The plants take that. They take some carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, some water out of the soil or atmosphere, combine it with that energy, and rearrange the molecules. Notice the one on the right is called glucose. It's got six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. And then it releases six molecules of O2. So when a plant takes the energy from the sun and, can, and changes it, changes the carbon dioxide and water into hydrocarbons, it releases oxygen. 
One hypothesis for the history of the world is that that's where our oxygen came from, that the pl plants over billions of years released enough oxygen to raise our oxygen level in the atmosphere up to 21%. But these hydrocarbons that form glucose, they contain energy from the sun. Now, now we're getting now we're getting into wood as fuel. Plants take this light energy, combine with the water and carbon dioxide, and form hydrocarbon molecules. Here's an example of one that we call cellulose. This is the woody fibers of a plant. Another kind of hydrocarbon they can make is called dextrose. This is also what we call sugar. Notice how similar they are. Uh, both have six carbons. And uh, one has 10, the other has 12 hydrogen, and one uh, five oxygen, six oxygen. Pretty similar, but what a difference it makes in the uh, the plant. The uh, the woody fibers, one thing. Sugar we can eat, we can digest it. Woody fibers we can't. It'd be a termite or something. So just that little bit of difference in the chemistry makes a huge difference in to us in what we do with the hydrocarbons. Now. When the plant dies, this is an important concept, when the plant dies, those hydrocarbons can reverse the process. They can combine with oxygen from the air and give off energy and light, and then give off the, the two kinds of molecules from which they were made, water and carbon dioxide. So it's a reverse of the process. <coughs> so we call this oxidation. And so the energy stored in hydrocarbons can be released by this process of oxidation. It can be slow. If you take old rotting wood in a forest, it's slightly warm because the hydrocarbons in the wood are oxidizing, giving off carbon dioxide, water, and heat. Now this can, this is, it can be very slow. It can be moderately fast. It can be uh, metabolized in animals. Here's an animal, one of us eating some hydrocarbons. And what we do is we take in the hydrocarbons, our body metabolizes it, in other words, it, it oxidizes it. And it produces carbon dioxide, which we breathe out, and water vapor, which we breathe out. Um, and that gives us energy. So we get energy from eating food, as do other animals. Or the energy can be released rapidly, which we call fire or combustion. So when we see a forest fire, that's the solar energy that was stored there during the plant, during the tree's lifetime, that's now being released all at once. So this brings us to combustion, the very concept of fire. So from a chemistry point of view, we might take a simple hydrocarbon, like methane, CH4, combine it with a couple of oxygens, it will produce carbon dioxide and water. This is your basic combustion formula. This is what goes on on the top of your gas stove in your gas furnace, um, where you burn methane to get heat. It produces carbon dioxide and water. The water is vapor that's dissolved in the air. You don't see it. Now, if you, you notice in the previous thing, we had one, one methane to two oxygens. If you don't have enough oxygen, you get a partial combustion. In this example, we take some methane and combine it with some oxygen, but there isn't enough oxygen. So we end up with a molecule with one carbon and one oxygen, and we call that carbon monoxide and water. So carbon monoxide is an incompletely burned uh, hydrocarbon. So that's part of what's in a lot of fires. If the fire doesn't, doesn't get a complete mixture of air and, and fuel when it burns, some of the gases coming off from the fire will be uh, carbon monoxide. So when we burn wood, besides the, uh, the simple molecules I've talked about, there's other things in it that aren't good for people like benzene and formaldehyde that are in the, the smoke from burning wood. But the other things that are in there, uh, in a plant, you've got dirt, you've got all sorts of other compounds, um, and you've got unburned wood. And what happens is that the smoke has little fine uh, particles in it. And some of them can be extremely small. 
And those are the ones who are the most concerned when we deal with, with smoke, are the fine particulates. In this diagram, we have the big long thing is a human hair. And next on the left of that is, is fine beach sand. So to give you some idea what we mean by a fine uh, particle, we're talking about something that is much smaller than a human hair. And we say it's less than 2.5 micrometers. That's a micrometers, a millionth of a meter. So what it means is it's much, much smaller than a human hair so that this kind of dust, this kind of fine particles float in the air and you can breathe them in. And they're so fine, they can go all the way deep into the lungs and get stuck there. And so this kind of, this is where the fine particulates are the, are the ones that are most important in understanding damage to the human body because they go deep into the lungs, they get stuck there, they irritate the, uh, the lung material and cause problems like bronchitis, emphysema, and even cancer. <coughs> okay, we're getting near the end. Charcoal. Let's talk about this concept. Um, if you take wood and heat it, and again, don't, and, and you don't give it enough oxygen, so you heat it in the absence of oxygen. A lot of the other things that are in wood will evaporate, the moisture will evaporate, and it'll leave you with mostly carbon. And that's what we call charcoal. So heating wood in the absence of oxygen uh, removes most of the other things in the wood and leaves you mainly with just carbon. We call that charcoal. So if you go down to the store and you wanna buy this kind of charcoal, you would buy lump charcoal and you open up the bag and it looks like blackened pieces of wood, which is exactly what it is. Um, if you get briquettes, they've been ground up and formed into little packets and they've also got coal in them and some other stuff. Um, now charcoal burns hotter, longer and cleaner than wood. So it's got some advantages to, to uh, burning it. And it weighs less. So this is an important characteristic of charcoal when it comes to environmental impact, we'll talk about later. You can still get incomplete combustion. That's why they tell you never try and heat your house with your uh, barbecue in, indoors in case you lose, lose power or something. So it can still be... Uh... So that's, the, kind, that's this, the portion on the science of fire for today. There's a, another section called the technology of fire, um, and uh, that's a separate presentation.